Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote address will be on the importance of Singapore and their ties to peace, stability, and economic growth in the region. And may I please request each one of you to put your hands together as I welcome a man who's had a career diplomat, having served in Frankfurt, Berlin, Kathmandu, the US, a thought leader who's been a part of various ministries, be it Ministry of External Affairs, Defense, Atomic Energy, and Space, an author, a passionate photographer, a sports person, a man who runs various ads. We are privileged by the kind presence of His Excellency Javed Ashraf, our Commissioner of India to Singapore. A round of applause as we join us in the So I decided to speak from here because I'm barely visible above the podium. So it's easy for you to see me um, and hear me at the same time. Um, first of all, let me uh, send a very warm welcome uh, to the Honorable Chief Minister of the Sun Kissed uh, Shoreline City and uh, of Puducherry, Sri Veenarayana Swami. I have the great privilege and honor of working with him when he was the Minister of State in the Prime Minister's office. And in all those stressful moments, he's the one who kept us in good cheer and humor. He was very kind and a wonderful leader. So, uh, delighted and honored to have you here. We're also privileged to have with us here today uh, Ms. Manachi Lehi, Member of Parliament uh, from Delhi. Standing, a articulate and forceful speaker in Parliament, and really one of the great faces of New India. So please give her a round of welcome. <laughs> Mr. Deepak Lama, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to the Economic Times uh, for hosting its first Asian Leadership Summit here in Singapore. A uh, place clearly which is at the heart of our own economic relations, but also a gateway for India, a springboard for India to the east, and for the world, a gateway to India. So it is really an appropriate place to have this uh, conference and this summit. This has been a busy year for summits, and in a crowded space of Singapore where summits take place almost every week, this is the third we are having in the course of the last five months. Uh, we had one with a, of course, a rival media house uh, in the Sun Times. Uh, the High Commission of India had one where we had about 4,000 people participating over two days, and we had about 4,000 participants, 90 speakers, over 100 startups from India. And it just goes to show to you, and with this very well attended seminar, the importance that we attach to Singapore in our external engagement in our Act East policy and in our larger vision for Indo Pacific. And it also reflects Singapore's own role as the hub of perhaps the world's most dynamic region and one that will shape the course of the 21st century. We've, uh, of course, in the course of the next one week or 10 days, we'll have three defense dialogues, the visit of a defense minister. But we'll have a huge participation in Singapore FinTech Festival, but we'll have a delegation looking at disinvestment propositions in India, and uh, a number of other delegations, and that just gives you a flavor of the intensity, diversity, and depth of India-Singapore strategic partnership. This relationship, of course, has great ancient roots, but it really took off at a moment of great geopolitical change in the world in the early 1990s, which was also a time when India itself began to transform and open itself to the world. Since then, our relationship has, of course, grown enormously into a strategic partnership that really meets the test of that definition. 
The figures speak for themselves, of course. Uh, Singapore is today the leading source of foreign direct investment in India. Also a major source of financial market for other forms of capital. 80% of our external commercial bonds are listed in Singapore Stock Exchange. Majority of our rupee denominated bonds are listed over here. Our bilateral trade, Singapore is the first country with which we signed a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement in 2005. Our bilateral trade is about 27 billion. Singapore is the sixth largest trading partner, accounting for 3.5% of our trade. Singapore is a major partner in almost all areas of development priority for India, urban development, infrastructure, aviation, skills development, water management, recycling, waste management. These are important areas of cooperation that are bringing our two countries together. The reverse, the reverse is actually equally true. Singapore is the leading destination for Indian investments that go abroad. Nearly 20% of all outbound investments from India go to or through Singapore. As I said before, we are the third largest source of tourism into Singapore. About 1.5 million Indian tourists visited Singapore last year, and it's growing at about double digits of 15%. Or so, making us really a very important source and of, uh, of, of an important sector here in Singapore. But also, it is, in a sense, this air connectivity is reinforcing the sense of proximity that we have. 18 cities in India have direct connections to Singapore. I don't think many Indian cities have direct connections to 18 Indian cities. And over 500 flights connect our two cities, and that is really leading to a greater flow of people, greater flow of trade and investments between the two countries. State, and we have the Chief Minister of Puducherry here, see Singapore as a major partner. And as you know, in India's federal setup, states play a very important role, especially in those areas that are cold strengths for Singapore. And now, as we both leap into the digital age, we are fostering very strong partnerships of startups, innovation, and fintech. It was in Singapore that we first launched the Group A International last year by Prime Minister Finarit Modi when he was here in June. Next week, we will launch Keen QR here in Singapore, which will again be the first place where we will launch the international launch of the application for payments. We've set up a joint working group on fintech, and together, we are looking to see how we can translate India's transformative experience in digital governance and financial inclusion and digitalization into a product that uplifts people from around the world. So this is a relationship that has an enormous depth and diversity in economic terms, but it is embedded in a very strong political relationship, filled with warmth and goodwill, great mutual trust and confidence, and we have a defense partnership that is among the most comprehensive of both countries. Singapore does more exercises with India than it does with any other country. Just at this point in time, Singapore's Air Force is in Talaikonda and West Bengal for our annual air exercises. We have the longest running naval exercises with Singapore. And our dialogue architecture is the most comprehensive. And together, we, our, arm force, our army also trains every year in India. In international forums, of course, uh, we have great partners in G20, in Commonwealth, in East Asia Summit, in IORA, this is Indian Ocean Rim Association, and we are, of course, uh, Singapore was an intellectual, economic, and political bridge between India and ASEAN. And today, when we speak of the India ASEAN strategic partnership, a lot of it is due to the relationship that India and Singapore have. And all of this, and all of this stems from our shared belief in an open, balanced, inclusive Indo-Pacific region, shaped and defined by rule of law, connected by secure seas, integrated by trade, and anchored in ASEAN unity and centrality. We're two countries, just as we, are, we embrace democracy and diversity at home, we are two countries that have unwavering faith in rules-based international order, in upholding international norms and law, 
and our firm faith in multilateralism as a way for the world to define its collective future. And today, just as in the 1990s, there are two important developments taking place. The world is once again at a moment of great geopolitical flux. It isn't just the rise of China and the emerging, emerging trade and technology competition between China and the United States. It is also the simultaneous rise of many countries in the region, including India. It is the disruption of technology, the changing character of the global economy, the absence now of any hegemonic power to underwrite the international order, the inability of the countries yet to come together to form a global compact which is leading to weakening of international institutions, multilateralism being in retreat, and the international order that we are familiar with being under stress. There is once again a challenge to rules-based international order. In India itself is yet at another point of table. We've seen a political landscape that is rare in our independent history. Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi's led government has come back to power with a stronger mandate and a much larger number of seats than it did even in 2014. And we are witnessing a degree of political resolve, clarity of purpose, and a commitment to transformation that we have rarely seen. And we are witnessing an internal transformation that is unprecedented in scale, and we are dealing with a world with a level of self-assurance and confidence and clarity, redefining the terms of our engagement. When you look back to those five years, we averaged a growth rate of 7.5% every year, with constantly strengthening macroeconomic stability, of declining inflation rates, of reducing fiscal deficits, of strengthening current accounts deficits, and growing foreign exchange reserves. But this growth was accompanied by an unprecedented improvement in access, inclusion, and empowerment of every citizen in the country. 350 million new bank accounts brought banking within the reach of all. 110 million toilets brought sanitation to most of the population. 13 million affordable rural houses, 13 million affordable rural houses built in rural areas, 5 million being built in urban areas, 80 million women provided with free gas connections, Electricity in every village, 97% of our rural communities have now road connections thanks to 195,000 kilometers of rural roads that were built in India. These are extraordinary numbers. 200 million small loans given for micro-enterprises, 75% of which went to women. These are extraordinary transformations that are taking place. They are not just a political and moral imperative, but they provide the foundation for sustained long-term growth and improvement in productivity. We launched the largest, largest affordable medical health care program in the world, through Ayushman Bharat, which covers 500 million Indians. It is a transformational change because that health is the difference between a future and a life of impoverishment for millions and millions of people. But as we look ahead, I think there are some concerns that have been expressed about the slowdown in the Indian economy. But I think if you watch the steps that the government has been taking over the past few months, systematically, systematically addressing the challenges that have led to the weakening of demand, including by recapitalizing the uh, banking sector, consolidating public sector banks, improving corporate governance in the banking sector, revitalizing the non-banking financial sector through a slew of measures, including partial guarantee by government for PSPs to lend uh, to NBFCs. We are addressing the challenges of the real estate sector by enabling through a recent measure that puts $5 billion for 1,600 
afford, uh, housing projects that are unfinished to be completed. And by enabling, enabling new finances to come into the NBFs, we're helping consumer demand pick up by, by ensuring that the quantitative easing and lowering of interest rates by Reserve Bank of India is really passed on to the consumers. By creating new conditions for foreign portfolio investors in India, including raising their sectoral cap from 24% uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the level of foreign investment permitted in each sector, by enabling them to invest in listed tech securities, in invest in REITs. By, so there is a very strategic effort to once again enable credit to start flowing through the economy because credit is what lubricates the wheels of the economy. We're also taking steps on taxation, the corporate tax rate, as you've seen, has seen a dramatic reduction, now an effective tax rate of 25% for existing domestic companies, and if you're a new investor in manufacturing sector, it will be down to 17%. We have cleared the GST, pending GST refunds, and we're making tax administration faceless and free from the arbitrariness and winds of tax administration. Exports have been given new incentives because, as you can see, so it is C plus I plus G plus X minus S, those of you who study economics, of each of those factors of demand we are addressing as a major way. So the fundamentals of the Indian economy are strong, the demography, the politics, the governance, the com com competitive and cooperative federalism, the scale of achievements, and the energy and enterprise of an increasingly young, innovative India. So we are quite confident that we will be back to 775 and 8% in a very short period of time. And as we grow, our engagement with Asia, with East Asia, will continue to increase and grow. We are committed to our practice policy. Most of our major partners are in this region. And most of our future challenges and opportunities will also be in this Indo-Pacific region. Now let me pause here for a moment and address two concerns that for those of you who are from Singapore uh, I would have in mind. One is of course in this position on the Regional Co Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Partnership. It's a something on which we have negotiated very strongly for the past seven years. And we as, have been as committed as anyone of the 16 countries to be part of our set because we see the economic and strategic merits. But like any Free trade agreement, RCEP is also about a balance of negotiated interests. There were some core concerns relating to the vulnerabilities about imports uh, that would have affected at this stage of our economy our farm sector, our small and medium scale sector. And therefore, given since some of those core concerns were not addressed, we were unable to join RCEP at this stage. We remain open to negotiations. And we believe that if it is in the interest of ASEAN countries and all the other major partners uh, to look at India's core interests and to see how they can be addressed in a manner that RCEP becomes comprehensive and lifts all countries together on a tide of prosperity. So it isn't that India was standing out. For seven years we have negotiated with a great deal of commitment and interest uh, in RCEP. And we have been very flexible. I can tell you a number of areas, including in services and investments, in accommodating and adjusting to the interests. But there were certain bottom lines that we thought would have been met and should have been met. And we hope that as we go forward, that there will be opportunities for all our countries to recognize and address those concerns for us to be able to move forward. The second question that people wanted to would like to hear about is the question of Anravati, which is of course in the domain of, um, of the state government of Andhra Pradesh. But let me just say this, that, the, that it is important for you to understand that Singapore Consortium was not building Amravati. Amravati was a project which the state government was building, and it is a project in which Singapore had done the master planning and was going to build a small part of the startup sector. It hadn't yet started, but a state government has, at this point of time, looking evaluating that project, 
to see whether it is financially viable or possible to build a city of that magnitude, and B, whether it meets the environmental concerns, because so much of that land is on floodplain, and so much of it is would require removing forest cover uh, from that area. These are not easy questions for any government to answer, and, and a democratically elected government will certainly have the obligation uh, to look at the project carefully. But that will never stop any state of India, including Andhra Pradesh, to continue to look for strong partnership across all areas of development with Singapore, and they have repeatedly worked with Singapore too, and Singapore companies to come to um, Andhra uh, Pradesh. So these are two areas, but beyond that, as we look to the future, there are going to be enormous opportunities as India heads towards a $5 trillion economy in which the trade component itself will be about $2 trillion. And there will be enormous opportunities in every area of Singapore's interest. We together, we will also can help define a partnership for the digital age and we can lead the world in areas such as digital governance, in, in financial inclusion, in digitalization, in fintech, in artificial intelligence, in the application of new technologies for development. These are areas that we are working with Singapore. We have to get our SMEs uh, together. Together we can work to help Indian enterprises increase their footprint across Southeast Asia and East Asia. But we must serve a larger purpose. And a larger purpose must be that we build a peaceful and prosperous and stable Indo-Pacific region that is neither dominated by one country nor driven apart by conflicts and competition through emerging and emerging great power rivals. Because India and Singapore share a strong belief in multilateralism, in rules-based order, in respect and adherence to international law, in unwavering commitment to maritime security and freedom of navigation, ours is a partnership that can really grow. So here's a political relationship that is free from contest and claim, from doubts and hesitation. We are a country, we are two, uh, two countries that do not have to argue over principles or reassure each other of our intentions. Our only challenge is to avoid complacency, our only obligation is to keep setting higher ambitions for ourselves. And as this world enters into multiple transitions and daily disruptions, the future will demand more from us, from India and Singapore. And we will be able to do more for the region when we are able to do more with each other. And that is the defining agenda for India and Singapore. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, sir, for your kind words, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, a round of applause as Sir shared and we are upholding multilateralism by working towards a better future, lifting all ASEAN countries together. Very rightly said, and I'm sure each one of us is here to support and work towards the similar vision.